treating people well. I mean, that's the that's the main thing. I mean, just being kind to people and you know, people with respect and uh, that's helped me the most. It's just making friends. Let's talk to some of the most successful entertainers, athletes, business pros, and hustlers and find out exactly how they made it and what's next. We call it disrupting the process. Today we have John Nicholson taking a seat with us. He has over 30 years in the record business. He currently works with Disney Music Group and Hollywood Records. How are you doing, John? Thanks Excellent. for hanging out with us. Absolutely. So let's get right into it, man. When it comes to your job, what is your daily process? Wake up, see what my records are doing, just to give me a, an idea of who I need to be calling to, to get more spins out of them, or if somebody's actually played a record that I didn't know they were gonna play, communicate with my bosses in LA and New York and kind of strategize what's gonna happen. Depending on the day, if it's Monday, strategize for the rest of the week. If it's in the middle of the week, what's happening with the records, with the tours, with any of the different aspects that I've gotta deal with. Just to give people an idea, what is your job description? I'm regional director of marketing and promotion, so in the Southwest, anything that happens with an artist that's on the label, um, be it getting airplay, um, interviews, uh, any kind of marketing um, that's happening in the region, I'm involved in. You've been doing this over 30 years. I started in 89 as an intern at Chrysalis Records, the summer of 89. Um, so yeah, I've been doing it for a while now. When you think about it, it's such a long space in time as far as how you've been doing it. What were some of those lessons that you learned in your career that have kind of helped you shape who you are today? Treating people well. I mean, that's the, that's the main thing. I mean, just being kind to people and, you know, people with respect and uh, that's helped me the most is just making friends. Can you remember, like, who was the first artist you promoted for radio? I think Soundgarden, Sting. Oh, cool. Brian Adams. Um, it was at A and M Records, my first. So um, Soundgarden. Yeah. What do you remember? What song it was? Um, Blow up the outside world. Um, maybe. It, it was. I want to say. Was it the one of their successful ones? It was. It was towards the end of their career because I remember. Um, okay. I remember some crazy times that, on tour, um, which I probably shouldn't repeat. But um, yeah. You can repeat. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I just remember. Uh, Phones being thrown and craziness going on backstage. So there's a lot of tension back then. How closely do you deal with the artist when it comes to handling the promotions, like when they come out to do radio and whatnot? Are you with them like 24/7? Depending on the artist, I, you know, it's so funny. I uh, I can either be. The other day I was talking to one of my artists about how I'm the I'm the chauffeur, I'm the bodyguard, I'm the press person, I'm I'm everything that day. I take him to lunch. So some artists, I'm completely from sunup to sundown with them. Other artists, they've got a pack of people that do all that stuff on top of what I do. When it comes to radio, because you work with music so much, what would you say makes a song a radio hit? Like, what is it for you in your ears that when you hear it, you just know it's, it's a, a hit? Something relatable, like something people identify with immediately. An amazing beat helps. For me, the most important thing is a passionate vocal, like a really intense, really like well thought out song. I mean, it's, it's, it's all about the songs. I mean, songs have to be great. Being that the landscape of music has changed with the rise of streaming services. Well, the streaming services help in the sense that we, we know for sure, like, I, like, you know, I've got 100 million streams on something. It's, the audience is reacting. Somebody is, so when I go to radio, I'm like, okay, we've got sales, we've got this, we've got stream, they look at streaming. Okay. So if something's streaming, they're going to be more apt to, to put it on the radio station. Is it possible then for a, an indie artist to come out with a song that has over 500 plus thousand streams to get picked up by radio? Yes. It's rare because there's a bunch of guys like me pitching to radio stations every single day. And your label's artists. Yes. Okay. So, you know, independent artist has a shot, but it's really difficult. You don't see a tremendous amount of independent artists getting shots at traditional, at terrestrial radio. Being an artist myself, I know from personal experience that we aren't necessarily the easiest people to deal with at times. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, how 
do you navigate dealing with the egos just to making sure that everything runs smoothly? You gotta be straight with people, but also you have to kind of feed those egos a little bit. So it's a delicate balance. Now you're managing your daughter, Remy. Well, I mean, how, how is, I mean, describe your approach in that relationship being that she is your daughter, obviously, but do you like, what's your approach in handling her as a manager and also balancing it as a father? I mean, it's, it's just one big thing for me. It's, it's just not, there's no, like those roles are kind of like blurred. I mean, I, at times I, you know, I catch myself as a dad, you know, chiding her for something and like, oh, oh. I need to like stop and not make her feel bad about whatever mistake she made or whatever. As as a manager, I mean, like certain things I just you do, absolutely do not put up with um, early in a career with a, with an artist. And with her, I'm like, oh, I have to be a little bit more careful sometimes. And then sometimes I'm way too honest with her because she's my daughter, and that's the open relationship we have. And uh, so it, it's it's been difficult in some senses, but it really at the end of the day, we have an amazing relationship. So I'm able to talk to her about anything and, and like be honest with her and go, that was terrible. You need to correct that. Or don't ever say that again. Or um, you need to put more effort into this. And, or you know, she forgets a lyric or something. I, I, I get onto her about these sort of things. And I feel like I'm being a dad where a manager probably wouldn't say some certain things. <laughs> um, yeah. But as a dad, I'm, I'm obligated to. Right. Um, so. It only helps at the end. Well, it's gonna make her a stronger, better performer. I mean, she's, in the last six months, she's grown tremendously, and it's because of us working on it. Yeah, or what advice would you give to an aspiring artist out there who's watching this podcast and trying to figure out how to make it in the music business? You know, it's crazy. I um, actually overstepped my boundaries the other day. I went to a coffee shop to get some food, and there was an artist playing. And uh, I caught the last like four or five songs, and I really love the voice. I love the guitar playing, and uh, I, I approached, and I'm like, "Hey, what's going on?" I, you know, like I really enjoyed it, and blah blah blah. And so I just started a conversation, and um, I found myself gravitating, talent, giving her advice. And I'm like, "Where's your merch?" And she's like, "It's in the car." And I'm like, "Why would you leave your merch in the car? Set up your merch every single time." You know, even if you sell one t-shirt, that's one more fan, you know, one more connection. And then the conversation ended up, I ended up talking to this, this, this girl for a while um, about her songs and how they weren't, you know, they weren't grabbing me. Like they, they, her voice was grabbing me, but like as good as the songs were, they were all in this, this kind of the same plane. Like you need a little more variety and more intensity. And like, so I started giving up quite unsolicited advice. She claimed that she was really happy that I gave her all the advice. Yeah. Um, and then when I left, I was like, oh, was that my place to tell her anything? But I, I felt compelled because I really liked it and I wanted it to be better. I love it, man. Yeah. I love it. I've known you for quite some time. And one of the things that I've appreciated about you is your dedication to your sobriety. So if you can, give us some insight into how that came about. When my son was born, um, I was still drinking and never really did drugs, but when I was, I was drinking and I would see people and how they were, would act and I didn't want him to ever see me like that, health wise. Um, you know, I wanted to be a healthier person and drinking wasn't conducive to do that. I know you say health too. You've kind of altered your diet in the last few years and started doing things such as what, jujitsu? If I'm with an artist and something happens, what do I do? Do I just cower, do I run? No, I have to do something. With Remy, same thing, even more so because of you know being her father. If something happened, am I gonna jump in and do something about it? Where can people find um, Remy's music? And where can people reach out to you if they have any questions? I don't want people to reach out to me. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> no, I, it's, uh, I'm a, it, John Patrick Nicholson. Type that in and, and, and I'm sure it comes up on Facebook and Instagram and all that stuff. I'm pretty active on social media. Um, Remy is RemyRiley.com is her website and Remy Riley on Instagram and uh, on Facebook. Great, man. Well, thank you for hanging out with us today and letting us disrupt your process. Um, and to our viewers, thank you for watching as well. 
You can find out more about John and Remy at the links in the description below. And please leave a comment and tell us what you think.